All right. So today we're starting off trying to learn about magnetism and electrostatics, otherwise known as the combination thing, electromagnetism. Okay. You're probably very familiar with electricity. You've been using it your whole life. You're probably very familiar with magnets that are on your refrigerator and a bunch of other places in your life, right? Um, so we're gonna learn about you know, what the nature of these things is. Um, and one of the first things that was discovered about magnets, one of the first at least modern scientific things that was discovered about magnets is in 1819, a physicist named Hans Christian Orsted discovers that an electrical charge will deflect a magnet. So we already know about magnets. We're learning that a magnet was affected by an electric charge. Okay, so electric current running through a wire, right, would push or pull around the needle um, on, on, a, on a compass magnet, or on a, on a compass, okay, magnetic needle. Okay, so that's an important first discovery, right? Because magnets are their own thing, electricity was its own thing, and then this guy goes, well, there's something common between magnets and electricity, such um, chiefly that electricity or electric current could affect a magnet, and that wasn't known prior to that. So his discovery establishes that all moving electric charges develop a magnetic field, right? Magnets react or are pushed or pulled around by the magnetic field. If you've ever, um, oh, if you've ever played with magnets, right, or ever played with like um, iron filings around a magnet, right, or even ever seen that, you know that there's a magnetic field running in one end and out the other end of, of a magnet, right? A north and south pole of a magnet has a magnetic field around it. Um, and that's what affects the other, other magnetic or other ferrous objects nearby is the magnetic field. Okay, so the magnet or the, the uh, compass needle would not be pushed or pulled around if it were not for a magnetic field. So the presence of this little magnetic field around the, um, around the electrical current shows us that um, there's a, some commonality, some, some ability for the electric field to produce a magnetic field. And that was a big important discovery, right? Electric currents could produce magnetic fields. Prior to that, it was just thought that magnets had magnetic fields and they were just a property of magnets. Now we're learning that we can create a magnet right? An, an electromagnet. Yeah, we can make a magnet that turns on and turns off, right? Because you can turn on and turn off electric current. So this discovery later down the line, we'll learn, leads to the development of both motors and electric generators. Um, a motor is something that uses electricity, right? To, um, to spin a, to, in, in effect, to spin a shaft, right? To turn something. Okay, an electric generator is something that uses mechanical energy, such as somebody turning a crank or an, a gas engine spinning a shaft to generate electricity. So it can go either way, right? You can either take electricity and create mechanical energy from it, create movement from it, right? Such as like all of the electric cars nowadays, right? Um, every fan you've ever turned on, okay? And a number of other things, those all have electric motors in them. You're taking electricity, and creating mechanical mo motion from it, right? Mechanical movement. And you can take mechanical movement and convert that into electricity. Again, that's an electric generator. Um, does anybody have an electric car? Or a hybrid car? No? All right. They're gonna become more and more common in the, in, the, in the coming years, right? But you may or may not know, like the electric cars, they have, well, this is, you, may, you definitely know this, right? They have a battery, battery turns a little motor, that turns wheels, right? Turns ti the tires on the car. Okay, good. Um, that's the electric motor part of it. But then a lot of these vehicles have the ability to, as you are going down a hill, you're not using the electric motor, you're not needing to generate, um, uh, to use uh, the electrical power to, to move the car because it's just using gravity to go down the hill, right? So as you're going down the hill, instead of using the brakes to slow down, the car can use the electric motor and basically reverse this process, right? The car wants to push down the hill. The wheels are being turned by the force of, of gravity pulling the car down the hill. And you can slow the car down and charge up the battery, okay? It's, it's regenerative braking, okay? It's basically this exact thing, having an electric motor that can switch roles and become an, a, an electric generator, okay? So this is a big, important thing. 
is that electricity, magnetism um, have the have this common common thread um, that allowed us to build these things like electric motors, and they are just everywhere nowadays. Electric motors, as well as generators, and we'll get to that in the next upcoming chapter. Um, so, because of this magnetic field running through electric uh, a wire, running through a wire carrying current. Um, cell phone towers, right? Uh, acti activated cell phone, um, excuse me, because of this magnetic field, an activated cell phone would disturb nearby computer speakers. Um, wires running electricity through them interfere with each other, okay? Has ha the MAs that are, um, or people who are doing the MA program, have you guys, has Linda talked to you guys about the EKG at all? The EKG machine, right? And she's mentioned, she's probably mentioned things like don't cross those wires over each other, right? have the patient turn off all their electronic devices, yeah? The reason for this is because the electricity running through those wires, the electronic devices that the parent, the parent, parent that the patient may be wearing, right? Those all are running electric current through their little wires on the inside of them, right? Then the wires through the uh, electrode cables on the EKG, and all of those generate a magnetic field. Okay? As you see in this little picture here, they give you a direction of electricity going from um, uh, your left to your right on the screen, okay? And from that, the direction of electricity, a magnetic field will be um, will, will begin, will, will start. It'll create a magnetic field moving perpendicular to the direction of current. So moving out around the wire is a magnetic field. And this is true of any wire carrying an electric current. It generates a magnetic field around it and these magnetic fields can interfere with each other, okay? You learned uh, from the previous slide that Orsted's little compass needle was pushed around by the electric current moving through a nearby wire. Well, a nearby wire with a magnetic field around it can generate or affect an electric current in a nearby wire. It's the same phenomenon. Okay, so this makes for electric interference. This is one major reason why all of the wires, um, you know, you notice every, um, every charger cable, every, you know, every cable like running from my microphone to computer is insulated with rubber. Everything plugged into a wall has a in rubber insulated wire, right? All of that is to protect the magnetic, or to, to keep from magnetic fields nearby, or that magnetic field being generated running through that cable from interfering with anything nearby. Okay, it's one major reason why there's insulation around all of the wires that we have in, on, every, on every cable. Okay, so good. Um, electric power lines, as we said, also generate powerful magnetic fields around them, that, which can cause things like static on radio or TV speakers, or potentially in your car as you drive near enough to them. Um, this is not super commonly seen, but it's definitely possible, right? Um, all that your antenna on your car is, is car is is a little receiver for, um, for radio signal and it generates a small amount of electric current moving down the wire or down, down the antenna to your car's radio and a magnetic field nearby can interfere with that. So these are interferences coming from electric currents generating a magnetic field. This is why one reason why we refer to this as electromagnetism, right? Electricity, and magnetism go hand in hand. And it's, there's a really neat reason why this is. Right now we're just saying it is. Later down the road we're gonna learn why this is, okay? And the reason why, and in fact, we're gonna give you a little bit of the reason why on the next slide, it goes all the way down to the most fundamental layer of, 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 of reality, which are atoms, right? And the little parts of atoms called electrons and protons. So this goes all the way down to the, to the most base layer. Okay. So um, let me backtrack just a little bit. Orsted learned that any moving, this is hugely important and crucial, that any moving electric current generates a magnetic field. That's important. Any moving electric current generates a magnetic field. Okay, so something that is electrically charged and is moving will always have a magnetic field around it. It's not explicitly stated right here, but that's what it means. That's what it is. Any moving electric current, any electric current then generates a magnetic field. Okay. 
So everything, all matter, all stuff. By the way, this is like the second half of the first part of your first um, section of your textbooks, chapters six through 10. Chapters one through four lead us up to this point. Oh, excuse me, chapters one through four. Chapters one through five lead us up to this point. We, don't, we go over those chapters later down the road. Um, but in those we talk about, and, and it's not that important that we have them as a precursor, but we talk about atoms, okay? The fundamental unit of all matter, which is an atom, right? You know, you're made of cells. Your cells are made of molecules. Well, molecules are just built on atoms, okay? That's what if, if the periodic table over on the wall over that, that's what every little square is, is just a different kind of atom, okay? Atoms are in a, a dense nucleus with things called protons. They have a positive electric charge. And orbiting around those uh, nuclei are electrons, which carry a negative electric charge, okay? The important thing here is that all fundamental particles, electrons, protons, they all spin, okay? Very much like, um, you know, a globetrotter can take a basketball and spin it around on their finger, right? That's spin. It's, uh, and the fancy way to say that is angular momentum, but don't worry, don't worry about that yet. Spin is a type of motion that all fundamental particles have. These fundamental particles, we call them electrons, protons, and I haven't mentioned neutrons, but neutrons as well. These are what atoms are made of, and you're made of atoms. Okay, so everything, every piece of matter is made of atoms. All atoms have pieces, particles. Those particles all spin, okay? And you can't take it away from them. Um, you know, like, um, you have mass, right? And we can't take your mass away from you, okay? Uh, no matter what we do, you still have the same mass. I mean, we'd have to take parts out of you to remove mass from you, right? But you have mass. That's a conserved quantity, right? It's one of your conserved quantities. Well, fundamental particles have some conserved quantities, things that cannot change about them, okay? They have a mass, they have charge, electric charge, and they all have something called spin, okay? Spin is the one we care about right now. We don't care about mass or necessarily electric charge too much right now. Spin is conserved, right? Where a globetrotter can spin a ball on their finger and then like if somebody touches it, it stops spinning, right? All fundamental particles spin fundamentally. That's something that doesn't change for them, okay? All right, so earlier we said all electrically charged and electric, all electric currents, right? All moving electric currents generate a magnetic field. Now we're saying that all fundamental particles are always moving, right? Regardless of like their little jiggling that creates heat, all fundamental particles spin, okay? These are electrically charged particles. Electrons have a negative electric charge. Protons have a positive electric charge. In a little while, upcoming chapters, we're gonna learn what really electric charge means, but right now just take it as, as, a, as a statement. Okay, so we have an electrically charged fundamental particle, electron or proton, and it's always spinning, or in other words, moving, okay? So, something that is electrically charged is moving should generate a magnetic field, okay? So hang on to that. Good, protons, electrons have electric charge. They develop a magnetic north and south pole because of their spin, okay? Much like Earth, in, in fact, almost exactly like Earth, right? You know Earth has a magnetic field. Can you prove that Earth has a magnetic field doing anything simple? Like birds and other animals know it without having to prove it. How could you prove to me that Earth has a magnetic field? I can prove it really quickly. I can get on my compass, right? And my compass points where? Where do compasses point? North, right? Um, compasses point north, yeah? Because they're aligning themselves, their little needle, right? The little compass needle. Raise your hand if you've never seen a compass. Okay, everyone's seen a compass, right? We know that it points one direction, right? You can turn the compass around, okay? And the needle always points north, okay? North and, north and south, but you get the idea, right? It points in one direction, okay? That's pointing towards Earth's magnetic north pole. In fact, in fact, let me let me actually correct that. It's pointing towards Earth's magnetic south pole. The north pole, the needle points towards the south pole. But we call that north, right? There's a lot that we need to go over. Um, 
protons, electrons, fun these fundamental little particles, are very much like that, right? Earth is spinning, and on that axis that it's spinning on, much like a globetrotter spinning a basketball, there's an axis, a vertical axis that the ball is spinning on. There's a vertical axis that the Earth is spinning on, and there's a vertical axis that all these little fundamental particles are spinning on, okay? That gives rise to a magnetic field, which has a North Pole and a South Pole. It ends. The, the field lines the field lines come out of one end and into the other end. And they sort of bloom away from the away from the object. Okay? And this this in fundamental particles is because they're electrically charged and they're always spinning. Okay, they always have this thing called spin. there is a direction of spin, okay? We call them spin up and spin down. Um, these fundamental particles, electrons, electrons are the important ones. Protons kind of sit in the nucleus of an atom and don't do very much except give the atom mass. But these orbiting electrons that kind of hang out around the atom, they're always spinning, as we said, um, and we care about their direction of spin, right? Um, where you can take, like a globetrotter spinning a basketball, can take it and spin the basketball one direction, right? and spin the basketball the other direction, that doesn't really change much except for the way the basketball is spinning, okay? But the direction of spin for these fundamental particles changes where the north and south pole is, okay? And these guys can be either spin up, where the north pole faces up, or spin down, where the north pole faces down. Um, that will become more important later. It's more a little, little trivial right now. But the important thing that I want you guys to get is that these fundamental particles, electrons, protons, neutrons, the ones that have electric charge, electrons and protons, we care about their spin because their spin gives rise to something called a magnetic field. So we have an electric field, electric charge, and we have a magnetic field. The magnetic field has to be produced. The electric charge is intrinsic, the magnetic field is produced by the spinning motion of these particles. Okay. We call that um, direction of, of spin giving rise to an upward facing or downward facing north and south poles, the magnetic moment. So within a area in the atom where the electron can be found, we call these suborbitals, um, these electrons always pair up. They always pair up into groups of two. These groups of two have one spin up electron and one spin down electron, one with the north pole facing up, one with the north pole facing down, and they sort of balance each other out. What I'm trying to work up to here is talking about magnets, okay, big magnets, okay, but big magnets are made from these very small magnets, right? magnets made of fundamental particles. Okay, so you take an atom, okay, and you fill it with electrons. These electrons group up into groups of two. As we're trying to show here, you have areas in the atom where the electrons can be. We call these little areas suborbitals. And in a happy filled atom, these suborbitals will be full. However, some atoms, the atoms that like to interact with other atoms, so quick little short lesson on the, on the periodic table. On the far right of the periodic table are that, is that light blue column. You guys see it there? What's the symbol at the very top? Helium, Helium right? And we've got like uh, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, I forget the last one. Radon. Radon. Yeah, Ray, oh, radon's important. Um, but in any case, that far right on the periodic table, all of those atoms are called noble gases, and they don't interact with other, other atoms. The reason why they don't interact with any other atoms is because all of their little sections in the atom that could otherwise not be full are full. 
okay? And they don't need to interact with anybody. That's why they're called noble gases, because they're too good to interact with all the other atoms. But most other atoms have an odd number of electrons in at least one of their suborbital locations, these little spots in the atom. These suborbitals can get very, very complicated looking. Uh, when we do um, physics section, we'll talk about orbitals and suborbitals, and you'll see all these funny shapes for, for them, but right now we're making them a simple kind of little blob, okay? And in these little blobs, you can fit two electrons. When an atom has less than two, so one, right, um, it's, there's an imbalance, right? If you look and you just, like, if you kind of, let's zoom in here, right? Every little electron has a north and south pole, and if you count the number of north and south poles on the top part of this atom, right? So let's go, we have, we have a north pole facing up and a south pole facing up on the left side. And on the right side, we just have a north pole facing up. Right, so if you count the top of this atom here, we have one and two north poles and only one south pole. That gives us slightly higher north pole count towards the top of the atom, okay? Now down on the bottom, it's completely equal. So what this gives rise to is a tiny amount of more north pole up towards the top of the atom than south pole, okay? And you get an, an entire then then an entire atom that has a uh, magnetic field with a defined north and south pole. Okay, and so now we're giving. So we started off with saying that electric charges generate magnetic fields. Then we said all fundamental particles have an electric charge and generate a magnetic field. Then we put some of those fundamental particles into an atom, and we say that when there's an imbalance in the number of them from top to bottom that gives rise to an entire atom with a north pole and a, with a north magnetic field, a north pole and a south pole, otherwise it's a, a magnetic field coming around the atom like that, okay? We're gonna call this a magnetic dipole, magnetic dipole. This is just an entire atom developing a weak magnetic field called the magnetic dipole with a north pole and a south pole. So now we've got the makings for an entire atom with a, with a magnetic field. And then you can just group up a bunch of these atoms together, a bunch of atoms grouped up together. And if you have enough of them, you have a big solid object that can be a magnet. You guys know you can magnetize iron, right? Like if you have something that's made of iron, a screw, usually like the, the big one is like screwdrivers, right? If you wanted to have a screwdriver that will hold on to a screw as you're gonna go screw it into the wall and it's not already a magnet, you can magnetize it, okay? What you have to do is you have to take a magnet and run the magnet along the length of the screwdriver in one direction a bunch of times, okay? Well, and a screwdriver made of atoms is just a bunch of these magnetic dipoles, a bunch of atoms that have a weak magnetic field. When it's not magnetized, when a piece of iron, let's say, is not magnetized, like a chunk of material like this being shown here, is not magnetized, you, what you have is you have a bunch of atoms that are all that they have their north and south poles all facing sort of random directions, okay? There may be chunks in the material called magnetic domains where there's a bunch of atoms facing having their north and south poles face the same direction and over here they're facing a different direction down here they're facing a different direction okay but then you take a magnet a, 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 something that is magnetized and you run it nearby all of these atoms and you can knock them all into the same direction and then you can magnetize a screwdriver okay some materials are not ferrous. Some materials cannot be magnetized, but in this case, we're just giving an, an example of an iron bar, which has not been magnetized, will have all of its atoms with magnetic dipoles. In little regions, they may all be facing the same direction, but as a whole, the material may only have, uh, may have several different areas where there's these domains where this piece of it's magnetic, this piece of it's magnetic, this piece of it's magnetic, but as a whole, 
that bar or screwdriver or whatever it is, is not magnetized. So we can then take and magnetize it. So if you learn nothing else, you've learned how to magnetize a screwdriver if you want to. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this is what's being shown here, right? You can take an iron bar, a screwdriver that's made of iron, is, it counts as an iron bar, um, and you can correct the direction of all of the magnetic domains of that material. And you can push all the atoms to be lined up in the same direction. And now the whole piece, the whole screwdriver, or the whole iron bar, whatever you're talking about, would now have a defined north pole and a defined south pole. In effect, the whole thing would now be a magnet. Notice how we worked up from fundamental particles have an electric charge and a magnetic field to entire atoms can have a magnetic field to big, big chunks of atoms, iron bars and screwdrivers, can now have a, a defined magnetic field. Okay, So we worked up now from fundamental particles all the way to magnets, as hand wavy as I can be about it. Yeah, so that's what a magnet is. It's a piece of material where all of the magnetic domains and all the magnetic dipoles of all the atoms are lined up in the same direction. And that's what your refrigerator magnets are, okay? Now, you magnetize your screwdriver. You're happy, you got a screwdriver that can hold onto a screw and you can screw the thing into a wall. Notice the screw never gets magnet, is not a magnet, right? It won't stick to your refrigerator, okay? But you can take a screw, put it on the end of your screwdriver, screw it into the wall, not having to hold it, you're happy. But then you screw up and you drop your screwdriver. Okay, you can very easily demagnetize it just by shocking the material, just by just by traumatizing the material. You can knock all of those atoms back into some weird order. This is one reason why um, magnet is one way that magnets can be um, demagnetized by dropping them. Any material that's easily magnetized, and I've been using this word ferrous a couple of times. Um, it comes from the term ferromagnetic. It's any material that can be easily magnetized is called ferromagnetic. I said ferrous, that's also fine. Good. So you notice like everything's made of atoms, but I can't magnetize my, you know, plastic microphone case. I can't magnetize my book, right? Even though it's got atoms. The atoms making up some materials do not make good magnetic dipoles but some materials do. Metals, some metals do. Do you guys know an example of a metal that is not um, ferrous? Um, if you, so you know like uh, most trucks are steel and you can take a magnet and stick it to the side of a truck, right? Um, but go try it on any of the new Ford trucks. It doesn't work because they made their bodies out of aluminum now, okay? Aluminum, and you know like um, you can't stick a magnet to an aluminum can. Okay, aluminum is an example of a metal that is not ferrous. It cannot be magnetized. It just has to do, and in physics we may talk about it, we can go into deeply the atomic structure of aluminum, but it's such a way that it just is not, does not lend itself well to being magnetized. Some materials are ferrous, others are not. Iron is a fantastic example of a ferrous material. It's probably one of the best examples. Okay, now there's three types of, three classifications for magnets. We've got natural magnets. These are things that are usually rich in iron. Um, they're referred to as lodestones or ferromagnetic rocks. Um, that They have weak magnetic fields and they can make weak, they, they can behave as weak natural magnets. And this is where we get um, permanent or artificial magnets from, are finding good materials that we can shape into interesting shapes and turn them into, into magnets. This is all your refrigerator magnets. They're called permanent or artificial, they are, they are either permanent or artificial magnets, but they are materials that are either already magnetic or are made to be magnetic Okay, by magnet. We just talked about how you can magnetize a material. So a material that's already magnetic or is made to be magnetic and yeah you've got um in various shapes you know bars horseshoes discs right 
to magnetize any ferromagnetic object, which is your screwdriver, right? Um, a strong permanent magnet may be repeatedly stroked alongside it. What that does is, as I said earlier, sort of knocks all the atoms into one direction and gives you um, a defined direction of, magnetic, of the magnetic field. And the very first thing we said today was that Hans Orsted noticed when he ran electric current through a wire, it generated a magnetic field. So electromagnets, these were discovered in 1819. That's, you know, 200 years ago now, right? It's a long time ago. 200 years ago, we learned about electromagnets and we've had them since. Uh, this is again, where we get um, electric motors from. So electromagnets, you know, very simply, um, a coil of wire with an electric current flowing through it wrapped around an iron bar to sort of uh, capture and trap the magnetic field, you can create a, a magnet uh, that you can turn on and turn off, okay? This is how all of your car speakers work. Have you ever, if you've ever, I don't encourage you to take apart your car speaker, but if you ever get a chance to look at a speaker for a car, there's a big magnet on the backside, a big permanent magnet on the backside, and then, um, like a coil of wire stuck inside of there that electricity runs through. And when that wire gets energized, it repels from the magnet and then attracts back to the magnet, repels and attracts back. And if you attach that to a cone, it can push air around. And that's all that sound is, is just air being moved, air compressing air, right? So speakers in your car are run on electromagnets. Um, you know, you go to a, don't go to a junkyard, but go to a junkyard, right? Look at the big, Thing that picks up cars right and it can pick up a car and drop a car right that's a big big electromagnet something that can be turned on energized becomes magnetic picks up your car and then turns off demagnetizes and drops your car so electromagnets okay let's talk about some of the characteristics of magnets and then uh, maybe I'll try to skip a little bit forward after that some uh, two basic characteristics for magnets um, are permeability and retentivity retention permeability is how easy is a material to magnetize how susceptible is it to being magnetized like paper and plastic not permeable, right? It's not susceptible to being magnetized, but iron, absolutely. Um, and then retentivity, the ability to hold a magnetic, uh, excuse me, yeah, the ability to hold onto its magnetic field once magnetized. So that's two, two different properties, right? Can or can't you magnetize it? And if you can, does it hold onto that magnetic field? Or as soon as you drop it, does it knock away that magnetic field? Do all the electron, all the atoms go and point different directions again? Yeah, so um, tapping or um, jolting a permanent magnet outside of an external magnetic field can shake the magnetic domains back into random configurations, causing it to lose its magnetic field. Your permanent magnets, your refrigerator magnets, are made of several different things. Iron has been the best example up to this point, but um, nickel, cobalt, and maybe some other ferromagnetic materials are commonly used. An ideal magnet, so like your, you know, like your refrigerator magnets that like, I don't know, what do you guys think? The, what's the longest you've had a fridge magnet on your fridge for? Go to your grandparents' house, right? They've had it since 1970 on their fridge, right? Um, it's still sticking to their fridge, yeah? And it's pretty much still as magnetic-ish as it was back then, okay? Um, that's because with these um, artificial magnets, they're being produced to have good permeability, so they can be easily magnetized, but then high retentivity. They can hold on to their magnetic field for a long time, okay? You can drop your refrigerator magnet over and over again, and it doesn't demagnetize it. But the screwdriver that you rub the iron bar next to, you know, go back to it a week later and tell me if its magnetic field is still as strong, will it still be able to pick up a screw, right? You drop it, it probably won't. So um, the ideal materials are highly permeable and highly retentive. They hold on to their magnetic fields. Most materials are good in one, but low in the other. Okay, so we've talked about ferromagnetics, materials that are easy to magnetize. We've given some examples, iron, nickel, cobalt, 
other things. Let's talk about other options. Some things are not affected at all by magnets. Wood and rubber are, are good examples given. Okay, you can't ever magnetize a tree, as hard as you try. Paramagnetic uh, materials, slightly attracted to strong magnets, have magnetic dipole atoms, but do not form um, magnetic domains. Oxygen, sodium are examples of that. Ferromagnetics, as we said, iron, nickel, things like that, strongly attracted to magnets and are magnetizable. And diamagnetics, repelled away from magnets. Water and glass are an, are, are an, are an example of that. Um, glass actually completely will uh, block insulate a magnetic field. Magnetic fields do not like to go through glass, so it's a good insulator. Here's an important thing, and it may not seem important now, but maybe later on when you care more about um, atoms and electric charge, and this will seem a little more weird to you, but right now it's just a statement. Magnets are always dipoles. Magnets always have a north and a south pole, okay? You know, you take a bar magnet with a south pole and a north pole, right? It's got the magnetic field that goes around it magnetic field that goes around it, what would happen if I broke that magnet down the center? Do I now have a, a, a south pole magnet and a north pole magnet? Or do I just have two small magnets? Think about what this says here. Magnets are always dipole or bi they always have a north and a south pole. So I take this magnet and I break it. What happens? I just have two smaller magnets now, right? So this could, these guys get separated, right? Right, now I've just got one and two. I've got two magnets. Now the magnetic fields change a little bit. Ah. All right, so now there's just two magnets with two different magnetic fields, okay? Um, you cannot, this, remember, because this, this goes down to like, the level, the, the properties go down all the way to the level of a single electron, right? So you take a magnet, you break it apart, two small magnets. Take this one, break it apart, now you got four small magnets, right? And keep doing that all the way down until you have a single electron, and it's still a North Pole and a South Pole, okay? So you can't get rid of this, um, this, this dipole nature. Right? Magnets always have a South and a North Pole. Okay, that's important. Um, not super important for what we're trying to do, but it just is an important concept. No matter how many times a magnet's broken in half, the remaining segments each retain a north and a south pole. Unlike electric charge, which can be separated into negative and positive electric charges. I can take, I can't, but the royal we, I, can take and put electrons over here all have negative charge, and protons over here all have positive charge. You can separate negative and positive electric charges, but you can never separate a north and a south pole. They are, there's all, uh, any, any um, piece of matter will always, if it's magnetic, will always have a north and a south pole. Okay, good, good, good. Moving on. Maybe we'll come back. Yeah, no, we're going to have to talk about this. Okay. So let's now learn a couple of laws. And, and don't let the formulas that you see in the textbook scare you at all. Um, I'm not going to make, there's every formula we have in the text is not going to be, you're not going to be required to commit it to memory, um, such as uh, upcoming, which is called Gauss's law. We're going to talk about it. The important thing with learning, looking at these formulas is, um, that you understand what they're saying, not necessarily that you can do calculations with them. Those are two different things, right? Understanding what a formula says and then being able to do a calculation are just separate, separate ideas. But let's talk a little bit about laws of magnets, laws of magnetism, okay? Um, such as two north poles will always repel each other. 
two south poles will always repel each other, right? And if you've ever played with a magnet, that's the fun thing to do with magnets, right? Is to take and like face the two south poles together or the north poles together and try to force them together, right? And then watch them like spread apart as soon as you let them go. But unlike poles, north and south will always attract, okay? So there is a, and this is a law, right? All north poles will always attract a south pole and all south poles will always repel other south poles and the same for common north poles. Here's what I said earlier, and I think it's just really neat when you learn it. Um, magnets point north, but what we call north is actually mag our magnetic south pole. And it will be like that for, I think it's like another 10,000-ish years or so. Um, the Earth's magnetic field, because, so what generates magnetic fields? What was the very first thing we learned? What makes a magnetic field? Uh, Moving electric charges, right? Um, the Earth's core is made of iron um, that is, uh, in effect, electrically charged, and it's rotating. Okay, so this moving electric charge, the core, generates a magnetic field. There's an interesting movie from, I think, a, a, a early 2000s, literally called The Core, and it's about the Earth's core stopping spinning, and it's a really neat, like, disaster movie, and they go and, like, they go dive deep down, and they restart the core with a bunch of bombs. But anyways, um, it's cool, cool science fiction type movie, but I encourage you to watch that if it interests you at all. Um, but the Earth's core rotates, generating a magnetic field, but that sort of direction of rotation is not uniform, and it changes over time. Roughly every couple hundred thousand years, the north and south pole of Earth will switch, and it doesn't do it like immediately. It sort of migrates over time, okay? Um, but it flips. Currently, the Earth's magnetic south pole is at our geographic north. So go to the north pole where Santa Claus lives, right? That's our magnetic south pole right now, okay? Magnets will point that direction, call that north, but it's really the, the, the magnet that you're holding that's pointing towards this way, that's actually the north pole of your magnet facing that direction, which means that direction that it's attracted to has to be the south pole, the magnetic south pole, right? We just said that magnets are, are repelled from common north poles and attracted towards the opposite, right? So if the magnetic north pole of a magnet, if the north pole of a magnet's pointing that way, that has to be magnetic south, okay? So, good. If somebody asked you, point north or point south, could you do it without looking at a magnet like in a room that's completely, yeah. Pretty easy, right? These are called your cardinal directions. It's something that's sort of built into people, right? And lots of animals can do this, but you can tell, with, and this is not, nothing to do with magnetism or magnets, but you can tell which direction is north or south. And people that live, you know, in tribal communities that have never touched a magnet, never seen them, can, can do that too. So there's something interesting about animals and people where we can recognize um, these cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Um, so nothing to do with magnets, but just an interesting fact. Um, okay, good. So I, I, I just, I can't, this always interests me every time I talk about it, right? It's, it's, it's opposite of what you think, right? The south pole for, magnet, for our magnetic pole is, is that way, geographic north. Okay, um, that's one important law, right? Like poles repel each other, opposites attract. Uh, number two for laws of magnetism is called Gauss's law. Gauss's law simply says the strength of a magnetic field is proportional to the product of the pole strengths of the two magnets. So the stronger the two magnets are, the stronger the magnetic field is. Proportional. That's what proportional means. However, it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the poles of the two magnets. Okay, so you've got a magnetic north pole and a magnetic south pole facing each other, right? And they're going to attract, yeah? The further you pull them apart, the weaker that attraction is, okay? That's an inverse proportionality. If I pulled them apart and they started to pull together harder as the further you pull them apart, that would be proportional, okay? The distance and strength of the pull is proportional, but it's not, it's inversely proportional. This is gonna be something very important in, in X-ray is to learn what proportional means and what inverse means, okay? An inverse proportionality means that one quantity goes down as another quantity goes up, okay? As distance goes up, the distance between two things goes up, 
the strength goes down, the strength of the pull between the magnetic fields, okay? That's one part of this. The other part of it, if it says inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Now I'll show it in, 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 a, in, a, in the, at the formula form here, but all this means is that, um, let, let me give it to you very simply. If you took a magnet that was one inch apart and it had a magnetic field, okay? The, a pull, right? Two magnets one inch apart had a magnetic field pulling each other. Now make them two inches apart. How much further apart is that? You were, you were one inch apart and now you're two inches apart. How much, huh? So, so let, me, let me just, let me draw it. Might make, might make more sense as I draw it. And I can use any numbers, but. Okay. So north, south, south, north. All right. Um, are these magnets going to push apart or pull? Uh, sorry, push apart or pull together? Pull, pull together, right. So the force is going to kind of go that way. Ah, that way. They're going to pull together, OK? Now let's say the distance between them is, if, let's make any, anything up. I used one inch, but let's say one foot, OK? They're one foot apart. Now there's some amount of force between the two, OK? Take those same magnets. And now move them two feet apart. Will the force go up or down at two feet apart? Yeah. It'll go down because they're further apart, right? That's what inversely proportional means. But if it was just they went down based on the distance, you would think you move them twice as far apart and the magnetic the pull gets half, gets cut in half, right? The pull, the amount of pull would get cut in half. But saying something is inversely proportional to the square of the distance, distance squared, right, simply would say that if I had an object one foot apart and they were pulling together, and then I moved them two feet apart, this would be four times less. So not two times less, not half, right? One, not, instead of a half, it'd be one quarter the amount of pull. Okay. So there's a formula for it, but and I'll show you the formula, but that's what it means, right? As two things move apart, they get the pull gets weaker, and not just a little bit weaker, but a lot weaker. Okay, so it goes by the square of the distance. This is something called the it says right here the inverse square law. This law was discovered in the uh, mid 1600s by none other than Isaac Newton, who the guy who who discovered the laws of gravity. Okay, and the inverse square law is sort of a universal law for lots of different things, but importantly for our purposes right now, magnets, it follows this rule. So here's the formula. The force is equal to a constant of proportionality K, and you have the magnetic strength P1 and P2, P times P. So this is just the magnetic strength of one times the magnetic strength of the other divided by the distance squared. We're not going to do any calculations with this formula. Um, I mean, let me, let me give you an example, though, that might help, that might just help you see it, OK? And for this, um, these constants of proportionality become important when, you, when you're actually doing mathematics and things like that. But, we can just, for our purposes, make the constant k just 1, because we can, because we want to make it easy for ourselves, OK? Um, it can be ignored. This is says right here. The constant can be ignored if the force is expressed in Gauss's, in, in Gauss units. Um, good, just as magnetic strengths are. So let me give an example. I, didn't, I don't give it, the textbook's going to give it, but let me try to make it, make it make sense. So for this example, two magnets are placed one centimeter apart with their south poles facing each other. What does that mean for, for um, repulsion or attraction? They're going to repel each other, right? And will they repel each other more if they're closer or further away? Yeah, they, they're repelling each other, right? And if you, as you move them closer that repulsion should get stronger, right? Okay. 
So two, two, two south poles facing each other one centimeter apart. If k equals one, because we were told in the previous slide that we can just ignore the constant, so k equals one, and once it once k equals one, just you just get to ignore it. Okay. So you notice they put the formula up here, and then they get rid of k at this following one here. Okay. And they're one centimeter apart, so we're not dividing by anything, okay? Because the distance is just one, and one squared is one, right? So they made an easy formula for you, okay? D equals one, ignore it. K equals one, also ignore it, okay? Let's see. If magnet A has a strength of 50 gauss, and magnet B has a strength of, that should be 20 gauss. Ignore that, that's a typo. 20 gauss. Gauss is just a unit of magnetic strength, okay? So, you've got 50 for 1, P1, the strength of 1, and 20 for the strength of 2. And the magnetic force is equal, <laughs> the magnetic force is equal to the product of the two forces divided by the distance, okay? That's what we said. Let me back up here. That's what we said here, right? Uh, the magnetic force is equal to the strength of the two magnetic forces, the product of them, divided by the distance. And we're making distance equaling one and constant equaling one because we can. So 50 times 20 is 1,000, okay? Now, let's do this up, up here. So let me bring this up to the board and see if I can um, adjust, we can adjust it a little bit. You guys will want a calculator out just so you can help me out here. So let's just transfer this one over, right? Force equals constant of proportionality times P1, P2 for distance squared. And we're going to say K equals 1, distance equals 1 right now, and our unit is in centimeters. Okay, so just transferring this over to here, right? F equals 50 times 20. And we said that means F equals 1,000 Gauss. Okay. This is number two. Now for equation number two, we're going to still say K equals 1, because we want to ignore it to make our calculations easy. But now the distance is going to be 2 centimeters. Okay. So to write this out, you say F equals, and the strength is have the strengths haven't changed, right? So 50 times 20, but now since we have a distance greater than one, we have to put that in. And it's two, our distance is two, two squared. All right, so 50 times 20, a thousand. Two squared? Four. So, a thousand divided by four. Two fifty. So the strength of these two magnets at one centimeter apart, as the uh, this is the same as what's over here, is a thousand gauss. Take those same magnets with the same force and move them two centimeters apart, double the distance, okay? And you get a new, mag new strength, a new force of 250 gauss, which is four times less than the strength at one centimeter apart. This is just the inverse square law. And you can play this game with any number for the distance and you can figure out what the strength between them is. So I can move this out to a thousand centimeters, right? And you can just plug in a thousand squared into your into your phone, right? And then you can do this formula the same way and tell me what the strength is, right? Go out to a thousand centimeters, and the strength is a thousand times a thousand is a thousand thousands is a million, right? So the strength would be a thousand divided by a million which would give us a very, very, very small number, right? Uh, um, 10 to the negative three, something like that, right? 0 0.0001, 0 0.001, something like that. Anyways, but the point is, is that we would have a very small number then, yeah? Okay, 
So this is Gauss's law, and all it's saying is that you have two magnets that have a force, etc. And it doesn't matter if the force is pushing or pulling right now. We don't care. In this example, the force was a was a was a a, a repulsion, a pushing force, right? And it's just saying that that force gets weaker the further they are apart, and stronger the closer they are together. Okay, and you can prove this because you can just take two magnets and try to shove them together, and notice that it gets harder to shove the magnets together as you get closer. And it's easier to kind of push them toward each other the further apart you are. Okay. Again, repulsion or attraction doesn't matter. The law still sticks. Do you guys feel okay with this? At least understanding what it's saying. I'm not going to ask you to do a bunch of calculations with it. I just want to make sure you understand what it's saying. Okay.